Hey, Gup Con Giants family. Today is our special episode. Our guest, Mr. Stephen Coprince of Coprince Law Firm. He is also the founder of the famous blog, smallgovcon.com. He's written more than 1,100 posts on government contracting legal issues. It is a must see, a must visit website, smallgovcon.com, for all things government contracting related. When it comes to talking about the FAR, subcontracting rules, 8A, and litigation. I is I actually wrote about Small GovCon in my book, The Billion Dollar Playbook. I use it as a resource and I offer it to new incoming small businesses, and not just new small businesses, small businesses who are active, businesses that are active that want to know about all the changing rules, policies, and procurement. Today's guest, Mr. Stephen Coprance, shares his journey. He shares common made mistakes by small businesses, some pitfalls, horror stories, and experiences over his decades, decades long journey into the world of government contracting. He's a nine time speaker at the AP Tech conferences and events, uh, been published nationally, been published for a while. So, again, we're very thankful and happy. Stay tuned for this upcoming episode of Mr. Stephen Coprince of Coprince Law Firm. I'm Steve Coprince. I'm the founder and a senior partner at Coprince Law LLC. We're a boutique firm, five attorneys, exclusively practicing federal government contracts law. I work with uh, hundreds of contractors across the country and a few around the world, too, on anything to do with government contracts laws. Going back some days, uh, you started out working for uh, in a law firm that did government contract law, correct? That's right. Yep. I've been doing uh, government contracts law my my whole career. I, you know, it's one of those things where you go to law school and a few people know exactly what kind of lawyer they want to be. Usually it's like your criminal defense or prosecutor types. They're like, I love going to jail and interviewing people. And that's not right. that's not me. I didn't know what I want to do, um, but I'd worked in government before on, on the legislative side on Capitol Hill, um, got a job with a government contracts firm and actually found that I enjoyed it quite a bit. And and that's that was kind of that. So f- fell into it and uh, been doing that ever since. And what made you decide to start your own law firm? Uh, it was uh, it was really largely a factor of a geographical move. So my uh, my wife and I lived in Washington, D.C. I lived in D.C. for a long time in that area. Good area to live in. But we had our first child and. You know, it was we were thinking about, hey, could we you know, move to a lower cost of living place somewhere where the traffic wasn't so bad, maybe closer to family. And that led us to think about moving to the, the Midwest, um, which is closer to both of our families. And there there aren't any firms out there that hire government contracts <laughs> lawyers. They're all in D.C. And, and so, you know, this day and age, you can do government contracts law from anywhere right. uh, because it's all Internet based. Uh, but I think when the practice started, when it really became a field, you kind of had to be in D.C. You had to drop off your papers with the agency or whatever the case right. was right. personally. And that's not the case anymore. The systems are all set up. Uh, that so that anyone around the world, you don't even have to be in the country to use these systems anymore. But that's but historically, that practice of law is based in D.C. And there are firms here and there that are not in D.C. that practice it. But where we wanted to move, there wasn't anybody hiring. And so I said, well, you know, I got to if, if I want to uh, move back to this area in the Midwest, I'm going to have to do my own thing or start a new new area of law. And I really did enjoy government contracts. I didn't want to, you know, start doing something else. And so kind of made the decision for him. Let's give this give this a shot. I'm advising small business. Maybe it would help uh, me be a better advisor if I was a small business. And I think it really has. Interesting. And what what about the government contracts law did you like the most? Yeah, I, I think a couple things. I mean, first of all, the law itself is really, really deep. And so when people, you know, and, you know, I'm still learning new things. I mean, there's so much to learn and you never uh, feel like every single day is the same. There's always something new going on and it's always changing for better or for worse. So there's always new developments going on, which which keeps me on my toes. But the second thing really is, and why I really um, grew to love it more as my career developed is the people that are involved. And so I, you know, I started, when I started working directly with, uh, small business owners, you know, mom and pop operations, folks were a little bit bigger, um, you know, knowing that my advice and my work was really central to them succeeding in business, putting food on the table for their family. That's a, you know, that's pretty powerful. And so I, mm-hmm. I found that I really connected with a lot of these folks in the field, not just the business owners, but a lot of the 
the thought leaders in the field and consultants and such that I ended up getting along really well with and respecting and liking. And so it becomes a, you know, it's a, it's a big country and a big world, but you run into the same people all the time. And, and I like that, you know, I like getting to know people in the field and I like working directly with the clients. So it's a perfect mix of a really deep area of law that m- makes me think as well as just great people um, overall that I've been work and privileged to work with over the years. Interesting. Uh, but at some point you retired. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, what's interesting is, and I'm, I'm doing the law part, thing part-time now. So I, you know, I got a little bit burned out. I won't, I won't be uh, dishonest about that, but I also found that, that um, I come from a family of teachers and college professors. And I, you know, as part of my legal practice, I was doing a lot of seminars and a lot of presentations mm-hmm. and a lot of courses and kept getting folks asking me to do teaching. And I found I really, really liked that. And I said, you know what, I'd like to have the opportunity to do more of that but I got this whole, you know, 60, 70 hour a week day job thing going right. on. So I, you know, I, I said, you know, what, I'm going to, I'm going to step back. I got a good, good firm full of uh, folks who can, you know, help our clients and I'm going to go back and, and focus on the teaching. And I did that. And now we're kind of doing it part, part way. So now, okay. I, now I'm working part-time in the law, part-time teaching, trying to find that, that right balance. Cause you know, it's, it's, and I did miss some of my clients, you know, I was going back and they're like, you know, we always get along really well. And so right. you know, I, I miss that, that sort of back and forth. So this has been, a, I think, a good, a good hybrid model where I do have a really good team back at the firm. You know, it wasn't, you know, started off being just me, but grew, grew a, a nice little boat boutique firm there and got great colleagues who are really running the day-to-day operations of the firm now. Um, and that frees me up to not just do the legal work, but to, um, do things like this and, and then right. do some of the teaching that I, I really enjoy. And I've been very privileged to do that um, with a lot of different great organizations. Okay. Yeah. I see um, it says on your profile page uh, that you've done a nine time speaker at national conference with, you know, AP tech. Um, is that where you're talking about in terms of your teaching? Yeah, that's some of it. I've got my my Aptac uh, mug right here. They you know they're they're not messing around at Aptac when they you know this is huge. I mean, look at this thing. I, mean, I know, they, I know, it's things your face. That's <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, this is one of my you know little token guests for being a being a speaker, and it is full right now too because it's yeah. It's, you know, I'm not a morning person, but but yeah. I mean, the the PTAC Association and they, they for those who don't know, Aptac is the National Association of PTACs, which is Procurement Technical Assistance Centers funded by DLA and sponsored by local colleges and universities helps, you know, um, mostly small businesses, but you know, you don't have to be small to get their services, mostly free services, things like setting up your SAM profile and all sorts of different things uh, that folks might not be aware that they do great organization. And so I w- I've done a lot of uh, speaking both at their national conference and at various PTACs around uh, the country, the individual PTACs is there a couple hundred of them, I think around the country, even off in mm-hmm. Guam and such uh, doing that. And then I've worked with some other organizations that Gavology does a, a great uh training series, uh, web-based training. And I regularly work with them, with some of my colleagues at the firm too. I've worked also with Management Concepts, another great organization and done some training, which is different in in that most of the students there are are government employees. And so instead of training industry, I'm training government employees. And I found that's been enjoyable to bring them kind of the industry perspective. You know, here's what Here's what industry's thinking about about right, different things right, that are going right. on out there. They, you know, if you're a career government government employee, you may not really realize what folks on the other side of the desk are thinking. Right, right, right. No, that's that's interesting. So when we first start the conversation, we were talking about uh, some of the the things in terms of what can companies do to give themselves an advantage, and we were discussing mentor protege. We were discussing joint ventures and. You talked about what happens when uh, people have to navigate and beyond the certifications, beyond the set asides and some of the strategies and things like that. Can we uh, can we revisit that? Yeah, it's, and it's a really important um, conversation, I think. And so some folks think, hey, you're you're a lawyer. All you're there to do is, you know, file protests and claims and all that stuff. Actually, a lot of what we do is, you know, it's kind of some sort of a blend of what are the what are the what does the law let you do and the strategic sort of counseling 
uh, for clients as well within that. And so, you know, when, when you're a small business and you've been successful as a prime contractor, often that's because you have appropriately been able to segment the market in some way. In other words, you're not bidding mostly on unrestricted contracts against right. billion dollar companies. You're bidding on small business set asides, or maybe you got yourself an 8A certification. You're bidding on 8A set asides, or hopefully getting some 8A sole source contracts. You know, the problems with those, uh, some of those certifications is they can go away. Um, right. You know, your 8A only lasts nine years uh, maximum, uh, and then it's just, it goes away automatically. Uh, small business, you couldn't can be a small business forever, but you know the penalty of success is you grow out of your size standards, and so mm-hmm. you know you grow, you just you, you're too successful, and you're no longer small. And while there's been this consistent drumbeat of talk in the government world about you know mid tier contracting and things like that, the SBA doesn't doesn't have any preferences for quote unquote mid tier. And so you're, once you're not small, you're Google, you know I mean? So sorry, you know, you're $1 too much, you're a multi-billion dollar and you're, you're in the same boat with those guys. And so that can be really daunting for folks. And some of them say, look, you know, I either have to stay small. I can't, I can't grow, or I don't know what I'm going to do when I lose my 8A certifications, my business going to collapse. And so one thing we do is say, well, well let's, let's hold on. You know, the SBA, which runs these small business programs has a lot of opportunities for businesses to maintain footholds in the set aside arena and the sole source, the socioeconomic sole source like 8A arena, even if you don't have those certifications. And usually that involves, uh, almost always that involves some blend of teaming up with one or more other companies. And the SBA has a great program. One example is called the SBA All Small Mentor Protege Program. And what that means is that any small business can um, team up with a mentor that is approved by the SBA. The mentor provides business development assistance to the protege. And in return, the SBA allows the mentor and protege to do a couple things. It first allows them to form joint ventures, which means you're forming a essentially a third company. It's unpopulated. It's really a legal fiction that lets you both be the prime contractor. But now you as the large business uh, mentor, non-8A, whatever it is, are now part of the prime contract team. And you're allowed to do up to 60% of the work and get up to 60% of the profits as the lead or as the partner member, not the lead member, but the partner member of that joint venture. And so now all of a sudden, even though you're no longer 8A, say you could get 60% of the profits of an 8A contract by teaming with an 8A company. It's not 100%, but 60% right. ain't bad. I mean, right. that's a, and, and the SBA then also, if you really, if you want to, and the, and the protege agrees, you can even buy an equity stake in your protege. You can buy up to 40% equity stake in the protege. You have to buy it. You can't make them give it to you. The SBA right. is, well, you know, it's, it's for the purpose of capitalizing right. the protege, but you can do that. And then you can get your percentage of profits in that way. So you can start doing the math. I'm not a math guy. That's why I went into to law, but if you do, you know, you're doing a joint venture project, you're getting 60% of the profits because they're yours, because you did the 60% of the work. And then the protege is getting 40% of the profits, but you're getting 40% of their 40% because you own 40% of their company. You see that you're doing pretty well for yourself. And that, and the SBA recently confirmed, by the way, that that is totally fine and legal to do it that, that that way, that that is not a, and that may be an extreme, you know, not every mentor has a 40% stake, but there are a lot of mentors out there that are, are, are doing 60% of the work and getting 60% of the profits. And I think it's a misconception that mentors have to be billion dollar behemoths themselves. They're not, I've got plenty of clients who graduated from 8A, for example, and flipped right over to being a mentor the, the next month. Let me, let's, let's, let me um, just, because I am a math guy. So let me just, oh, good. I'm you an official guy, <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just drawing yeah. a chart. Come so, back okay. the envelope stuff here. This is good. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm taking, I'm like, I'm drawing a chart. I'm not texting. I'm like, so I'm like trying to figure this out. Okay. So um, I can buy 40% of the small business. So now I own 40% of the company, right? Right. If, if, through, if you're the protege, you can buy up to 40% of your protege. Right. Okay. So yep. now the joint venture itself is going to get 100% of the contract. And then Correct. out of the 100, I, as the mentor, can do 60%. You can do 60% of the work and profits commensurate with work share. So you get up, you know, up to okay. 60% of that 100%, right? Okay, good. And then out of the 40%, right, of the small business, I also own uh, 40% of that small business. Correct. <laughs> right. And so now the profits, you know, uh, of their 40% profit, you get 40%, 40%. of that. <laughs> okay, so that's, right. another six, that's another 16%. <laughs> right, and so now you've got, what, 76% total of the-, of the 76%, right, right, exactly. 
Okay, and that's so, a pretty good deal. It's not a bad. It's not a bad deal. And again, that's that's kind of that's taking it all the way to the extreme right. that the SBA will allow. But that is you, yeah. And thanks for doing the math. That's more than three quarters of the value of that contract. Sure. And if you do that repeatedly, you can have a mentor protege agreement that lasts up to six years. You think about the contracts that you could do over a six year period and be getting that sort of of. Um, profit share. So sure. no, no, that's awesome. So, and, yeah, and again, keep, by the way, <laughs> uh, by the way, and, and one of the things, Stephen, I'm, I, I tell people and I tell small businesses that, um, yeah. So if they're getting, what do we say? 76%, but if you're getting 14% of tens of millions of dollars, right. It's better than a hundred percent of, of tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, and I, and you, you got to look at it cause I represent my actually mostly small businesses. I represent a lot of mentors, but I represent more proteges. Right. And so, you know, the protege doesn't have to sell the 40% equity stake no, if they want not. to. And if they do, they get to, you know, they get to price it however they want. You know, they can say, look, that, that stake is worth to me $3 million or what, you know, get an appraisal, whatever the case is. They don't have to give up 60% of the profits on the contract if they don't want to. They could say, right. we're going to split it 50-50. You know, right. that, that's totally fine, too. Um, but you're right. I mean, there's an economy of scale here. And so if you're, you're able right. to take on contracts that you couldn't do on your own, couldn't even come close to doing on your own, or couldn't, couldn't successfully win, because sometimes having that, that mentor firm at the prime contract level gives the agency the confidence they need to say, yeah, I'm comfortable awarding to these guys. Because now at the joint venture level, remember, the government can have – a direct relationship with each party. The government does not have a direct relationship with a subcontractor. So if you come in there and say, mentor firm is my sub, government might say, that's nice. But if you fire that sub, we, nothing we can do about it. You know? But at the prime contract level, the government, if there's a joint venture, government can talk directly with both parties, work directly with both parties, and both parties have to guarantee full performance of the contract, which means if the small right. business goes belly up. So that, that can give the government the confidence. So you can find yourself – it's going to depend on your circumstances, but you can find yourself as a protege doing much better by giving up a 60% uh, stake in the profits of a hundred million dollar contract versus just winning a five million dollar contract, and so Absolutely. and doing it all yourself, and so and and also keep in mind that under the mentor protege program, because I, I skipped by this because we're talking like the graduating firms, what do they want out of it? They want the joint ventures, you know, and the proteges often do too. But the mentor protege pro program does require the mentor to provide real business development assistance to the proteges. I, I always remind my proteges about this: don't let your mentor just skip to mentor project agreement, boom, joint venture. No, no, no. They're supposed to be providing you targeted business development assistance, whether that's helping you get a security clearance, training you on certain uh, aspects of FAR and DFARS, whether it is, you know, helping you get some sort of ISO certification, whatever, you know, set up a DCAA approved accounting system, whatever it is you need to take your business to the next level. You ask your mentor to put, to do that. They put it in the mentor protege agreement. And now the mentor has a contractual obligation to provide that to you. So I tell my project clients, look, you want to set up your mentor protege agreement so that even if you never win a single joint venture award, which is possible, you know, these are competitive awards typically, you still exit that mentor protege agreement in a much better spot than when you entered because you got that that business development assistance. What what other types of things um, do you see that, that they commonly write in uh, assistance provided by the actual mentor? You mentioned security clearance, DCA compliance. What are the, some of the other things that mentors should be asking for? Or, or yeah. not should be asking for, but that they typically, that they need, that they don't have, that you see them repeatedly uh, asking for assistance with or needing assistance with? Yeah, a lot of times it is things like getting those uh, certifications. Sometimes it, it can be financial assistance. Uh, I see this specifically with construction clients who need to bond mm. uh, their projects and they don't they don't have the bonding capacity on their own. And so what the mentor will almost in, inevitably provide in a good mentor project agreement in construction is an agreement to uh, guarantee uh, surety bonds for the, mm. the protege. That way, when the protege goes and approaches a surety, the surety says, you know, you don't have the capacity. And they say, well, wait a second. If I get essentially a cosigner, it's like when your right. dad cosigns on the, on the car, it's like, oh, well, I don't care if you, if you, you know, you're working at the fast food joint, don't have any money, but, but dad's, dad's good, you know, or mom's right. good, whatever the case sure. is. And so, you know, they see your mentor on the, on the, on the signature line. That's all they care about. They just want someone with deep pockets. They can go right. after if there's a default. And so, bond, you know, that sort of bonding assistance, I have seen other financial assistance where, the mentor might guarantee other sorts of loans or even directly provide loans uh, at no interest or very low mm. interest rates, although interest rates overall are pretty pretty low these days. But I've seen them guarantee bank loans, that sort of thing uh, for the protege, sometimes providing facilities 
you know, hey, we need a warehouse or we've got an extra space that we can rent uh, to do that. I've seen a lot of lot of training. In other words, hey, you know, we're going to we're going to come in, bring our our team in and, and help you learn to write a good proposal. You know, we're going to we're going to do that. We've got a, a really you know great proposal team. Instead of uh, us just writing your proposals for you, essentially, we're going to sit down together and train you and we're going to set out a schedule. You know, every every month we're going to get together and, and do this sort of of training. And it could be proposal writing, could be other aspects, project management, uh, things like that. I've seen also mentors help develop good uh, internal policies and procedures. You know, we're going to help you develop a good employee handbook. We're going to help you uh, develop a good, you know, proposal process, you know, all these sorts of things. Hey, here's how we, we red team this thing. And, you know, all, all these right. sorts of things that a protege just might not either have thought of, or they just don't know how to get started doing. And the mentor has the experience to come in and that can be extraordinarily valuable to sit down with somebody who's, who's been successful, who, who knows how to, to do this and can explain that. And so we'll say, Hey, name, rank, serial number, you know, tell us who at the mentor is going to do this, when they're going to do it, who they're going to provide the training to and, and stick to a schedule, you know, say, we're going to give them at least 10 hours of training on this subject per month, whatever the case is. When it comes to the actual, the, the, the protege themselves, um, how, typically when they when they come to you, do they already have someone in mind to be their mentor? Often they do. Often they do. Um, and unfortunately, I, you know, you, you might look at me and think I'm Cupid, but I'm not a matchmaker. So I can't, <laughs> I can't help you, you know, find a, right. But, I'm just wondering what people come to you at, like what, yeah. what do they ask for when they come to you? Because no, they again, do, yeah. folks listening to this, I don't want them to, to start messaging you afterwards. And, yeah, like yeah. you said, so I want you to lay the foundation, the groundwork for at what right. point, do I come to co-prince law firm, right? Yeah, yeah. When you and so that's it's a good question because I do get it. I get it, folks say I'd really love to have a mentor. Who do you know? And I'm like, yeah. I, know, I know a lot of people, but you know, I'm not I'm not a matchmaker. You know, I'm not Match.com or whatever here. Yeah. But but you know, I think the the best way to look at it, if you're the protege and you're thinking, boy, you know, how how do I even find a mentor? Because in my experience, there are all, always. Uh, tend to be more more proteges that are interested than there is a supply of mentors out there. Okay. That I, I think part of that is just that not enough mentors are educated about the program and the benefits. I think if they understood it better. But let me let, let me back up a second. So when someone comes to me and says, uh, "How do I find a, a mentor?" Um, what I I tell them is, well, let, let me tell you what the mentors themselves have told me about that process. Like how, how the mentors find a protege right, who, who right. they decide to work right. with. Right. And so, you know, I've talking, talked, talking, I've talked to a number of uh, mentor representatives, of course, both as my clients and then even with some of the, the billion dollar behemoths who have their own in, inside legal counsel. Generally, they have these folks on staff called SBLOs and, you know, everything mm -hmm. in government contracting has an acronym, but that stands for small business liaison officers. And th those are the folks who coordinate the small business programs for large companies who have subcontracting plans under the FAR. And so I, I say, well, hey, SBLOs, you know, and hey, clients who are looking for um, protégés, how, how did you, how do you find a protégé? How do you, how, how do you decide that you want to mentor somebody? And inevitably what they say is, and this is for folks who just want to go straight to, you know, hello, be my mentor is not what they want to hear, but it is, it's someone they have a relationship with before. You know, that is, that's what they say. They say, and what one woman who was, she was with one of the household named defense contractors, SBLO, uh, said when I was on, I was on a panel with her years ago. And she said, you know, don't ask me uh, to marry you before we've had a date. You know, and that right. was what she's like. Mentoring is a big commitment for us. If you think about that targeted business development assistance, we want to know you. We want to know that we have a common culture, that we get along well, uh, that, you know, we, we got it. You've got a nice certification. We love your 8A. That's great. Uh, but who are you? And, and so, it, typically, what I've found is that means um, doing some uh, work together that may be a subcontract uh, with with the two parties. And so, hey, you want these guys to be your mentor? Go to go do a subcontract or two for them. All these all these large businesses have subcontracting plans if they're large primes. They need subcontractors with different socioeconomic certifications. And so, approach if you can approach those SBLOs, they 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 love to hear from you almost uniformly. You say, here's here I am. Here are my capabilities. Here are my certifications. Let's get to know each other. I'd love the chance to work with you. 
uh, be the squeaky wheel a bit. You know, if you see a contract coming up that, you know, they're bidding on or if they might be bidding on um, that you could, could be useful to them, let them know. Um, but you get included on their team. They give you a little bit of work. You work together, you get to know them. And, you know, eventually a year or two later, maybe they're ready to, to mentor you. Now that that's a longer term process. And a lot of folks already have some relationships like that uh, that are out there. I have had a couple of folks who, literally got there with the old cold call and you know they they you know but those are more uh kind of niche industries where there are right. only so many players in the industry right. and so they're they're like hey we're a, we're a, a small business in this industry there are only a handful of larges right let's that do just this yeah right. let's, let's just right. let's just get to know those folks the one the one thing that i will mention that a lot that a lot of the mentors don't know and the proteges don't too because one answer that people get sometimes when they say hey we'd love to to be a protege to you. And the mentor says, yeah, we, we kind of like that too. We like you, but we already have a protege. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the SBA actually allows a mentor to have up to three proteges concurrently, three at one time. And a lot of mentors don't even realize that. And the proteges can't be actual competitors to one another because that gives a conflict of interest to the mentor, but there's a lot of room there. And so there may be a geographic difference. Hey, this is my East coast protege, my West coast this is my eight, a protege. That's my woman owned protege, whatever the, you know, whatever, you know, this is the, these guys are going after DOD contracts, the even industry, a lot of mentors are involved in, you know, large firms in multiple industries. And so I've had clients who are like, Hey, this is, you know, they've got a protege, but that's on the, in the, you know, construction side of their business. They also do facility maintenance and management, and we'd like to be their protege in that realm. And so as long as you can show that the proteges are not in conflict, oftentimes, yeah, but could we be your second protege? That sometimes has, um, you know, the mentor's like, oh, I can do that? Huh, didn't realize that. Let me look into that. And that's worked for a few of my clients where they've actually been able to become the mentor's second or even third uh, protege even though the mentor's initial response was, oh, sorry, we already have one. Okay, um, let's, let's take it from the standpoint of, I have someone who, for example, let's say they're a retirement government person, um, HR training, they manage large teams, they come out, they start their own small business, um, they identify people who th that they believe, and again, these are not necessarily their mentor is not necessarily a large business. They're another small right. business, but they're obviously larger than them. Larger. Right? Yeah. yeah, they're larger, yeah. but they're still yeah. a small business. Um, what can I do to educate that other small business on becoming a mentor? Because they're unfamiliar with it and they don't really necessarily know all the benefits of it. How can I educate them? Yeah. And so, so wait, you're, you're the say, protege and you want to talk the to them about I want to talk to them about yeah. it and say, hey, listen, you guys are doing whatever. Let's say 10 million a year. Uh, but I really do believe that there would be some so there's some synergies or be a, absolute some benefits from us working together. Um, you know, what what do I say to that 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 person as a potential mentor? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that for the mentors, the primary focus, and again, it's a good, you made a good point there, Eric, which is you don't have to be a large business right. to be a mentor. You you have to have the resources, capabilities, mm -hmm. et cetera, to benefit the protege and fulfill your duties under the mentoring plan, which almost always means you're larger than the protege, oh, right. usually, or more experienced at least right. uh, than the protege. But you don't have to be large in your your primary NAICS code or any other NAICS code to, sure. to be a mentor. A lot of mentors are, but you absolutely don't have to be. And so some small businesses, for example, may say, hey, I, I, I am just an ordinary small business. I'd like to get into the 8A in a, in a greater uh, context here and let me mentor a, a smaller 8A. And that's a, right. a And so, yeah, I, what I tend to do, and I've had this discussion with mentors as well. And I say, well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, what these guys come to me and they want free stuff. <laughs> like, what, it's like, <laughs> right. is this just, is this just a, a, a That's thing? what they think, right. <laughs> they yeah. want free stuff. And so what I, what I say is, is, look, you know, you guys are, um, you know, here, here's where you are in terms of your, your access to the federal prime market, right? And so you've got you got the whole market, which is what, $600 billion or something like sure. that in the last fiscal year, so roughly speaking. And if you're uh, just a little, say you're a large business, then maybe 75% of that is what you're eligible for and the 25% right. you're out because sure. it's small business or some socioeconomic subcategory of small business. And, and of course you can repeat that with, a, you know, if you're a small business, well, you're still frozen out of 8A and hub zone and all. Sure. And, and so we say, look, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you could uh, participate and get even the majority of contract dollars 
on contracts in that other 25% of the federal marketplace, which, you know, maybe $150 billion, you know, mm-hmm. say, okay, I'm listening, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> how, how do I do that? And say, well, that that's really what the, the mentor protege program offers the mentor, which is the chance to be uh, the a, uh, a member of a prime contract team. You don't get to prime these contracts yourself, but you can be a member of the prime contract team as a joint venture partner, which is a, a in most mentors positions often where they want to be versus being a sub to some small business, um, and get the lion's share of those dollars. And we start running through and say, okay, and then we, we talk about some examples of mentor protege teams that I've seen that are successful in bringing in you know, hundreds of millions of dollars over the years winning these big projects and say, look, your competitors are doing it. Here's what, you know, mm-hmm. you look at, you just look at it. You know, who is this mentor? What industry are they in? Who are their competitors? Uh, SB, I don't know if they still have updated this recently, but they used to have a list of everybody who was participating in the mentor project program that you could right. see. You right. say, well, you know, your, your rival over here is doing it, right. you know, right. and, and here's a contract they just won. And so, and then the wheels start turning and they say, look, you know, let's say that you're that there's a hundred million dollar A day set aside contract, and five of the bidders are are A day companies, and one of them is an A day, and you coming in as a joint venture partnership. Which which one do you think has an automatic advantage there? And they're like, oh yeah, I can see where that would be a a real competitive advantage. And so we really say, look, we're not going to try to sell this to you as you know, you're going to get the warm fuzzies of mentoring a small business. You can certainly issue a press release that says that's why you're doing it. But, you know, it's it, it's because it's profitable to you. It's, it's supposed to be a win-win. And that's right. what that's what this is all about. And, you know, if you're a long-term type uh, mentor who's thinking about long-term relationships too, you get somebody in your industry who ha- you have that close relationship with. There's all sorts of things you can potentially do together uh, even after they graduated um, or the mentor protege agreement expires in terms of working together. So we really tee it up as, as here's what this is. It's a unique opportunity. It's the only way that you can be a, a prime contract teammate um, for that big portion of the federal market you're frozen out of. And that's what the SBA is offering to you. And oftentimes that's what gets folks very interested. Like, oh, I thought I had to be a subcontractor to a small business and I'm worried they don't even know how to manage me. I'm, I'm not, I don't, I can't talk directly to the contract now, so I don't like that. Um, oh, I can be the prime contract level. Now that's interesting. Let's, 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 let's talk some more about that. Interesting. No, um, I think that's great. That's a great way to um, segue into the conversation uh, yeah. because, you know, we, we don't, we don't know. Um, we, again, we read these things and we understand the concepts, right? Uh, we, you know, we see the documents and we say, okay, this is what this means. But then when you when you approach someone, it's like, what do I lead with when we're having that conversation and approaching someone? Um, but I think that's great if you look at your competitors and see what they're doing, look at the industry, show them what the industry is doing. I think to me that that make a really compelling argument for someone who uh, was trying to, you know, get someone across the fence. <laughs> Yep. Yep. And I think that some of these mentors are just that I've talked to, they've, they've never done it before. Right, it's, it's, right, an, it's right. you know, there, there's inertia. And, so, and yes. so sometimes just, just getting the, the bravery to try something a little bit new can be, you know, and oftentimes I've found that these SBLOs, you know, while they're not the you know ultimate decision makers, often depends who holds that title It's someone higher up in the, in the food chain, they have the experience and they have the confidence and they say, no, no, because often they come from small businesses. So they say, look, I, no, this is not that scary. This is being done all the time. These joint ventures are being set up all the time. People are winning a lot of money with it and they can be a kind of an advocate for the, for the protege in, in terms of not, you have to pick this specific protege, but in terms of mentor protege, the benefits can be really outstanding if you pursue it and it doesn't have to be that scary. It's being done all the time. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. Tell me about the the rule, you know, the three and two rule. Yeah. And, and because, <laughs> cause again, we're talking about winning a bunch of projects, but then there are some limitations. Yeah. The infamous three and two rule, which SBA just, uh, just changed. I'd like to take credit for it. Cause I used to go around and give, give talks about uh, joint ventures. And I would say the three and two rules, the craziest rule in government contracting, silly uh-huh. should, SBA should get rid of it. And, and then they amended it. And so I'm like, yeah, they, you know, they're listening to me. No, I don't think, I don't think it has anything to do with, with me, but you. You, you know, I, I think they saw the light on it a bit, but there are still restrictions there. So it's really important. So 
what the three and two rule. Let me tell you what it was. And I'll tell you what it is because the SBA kind of has three and two light now. What the three and two rule was was a restriction on joint venture entities. And so when you form a joint venture, whether it's men or protege or any other type of joint venture, two small businesses just forming a joint venture, which they're allowed to do, you don't have to have a men or protege agreement to do that. But anytime you want to pursue a small business set aside or some uh, other socioeconomic subset 8A, whether it's set aside or sole source, um, then the SBA has rules about uh, joint ventures and what they can can do. Uh, one of those rules was it was infamously known as a three and two rule. And what that rule said essentially to, to break it down for you is that the joint venture entity, because remember the joint venture is a new entity you form, you actually register it in SAM. It doesn't right. have any of its own employees, but it exists as a legal entity. The reason is essentially the government's got to award the contract to somebody, you can't award it to two companies. So it's got to award it to somebody, awards it to the joint venture, joint venture, you know, holds the contract, receives money from the government, passes the money out. That's basically what the joint venture does. Typically does not have any employees of its own, although there's some exceptions that would allow administrative employees, but we don't need to get into that. So what the SBA said is, you know, each joint venture entity, SBA has always had this philosophy that a joint venture is a limited purpose entity. A joint venture is not an, an ongoing business concern for all for all time. It's supposed to be limited. And, and that's its philosophy. And its philosophy led it to create this three and two rule, which in its most recent form said, you know, once a joint venture, a specific joint venture, we'll call it joint venture A, just to, so, you know, because I can't come up with a better name than that. But we'll call it <laughs> joint venture A. You, you set up a joint venture. It's your first one. We'll call it joint venture A. Once it wins How its about, first contract. Listen. Co-Prince Coffee Joint Venture. There you go. I mean, Co-Prince Coffee easy. Joint Venture. Yeah. Right, there you there go. You go. So I'm, I'm working my way through this caffeine, my friend. So it's, uh, working my way through it. So right. I'm going to go for another cup after this, too. I got I got a high tolerance. Um, <laughs> so what the SBA said under three and two was when the joint venture wins its first contract, a two-year window opens. And in that two-year window, that joint venture can continue to submit new offers until either a the two years expires and so you you know you win your first contract today november 30th 2020 you've got till november 30th 2022 to keep submitting offers uh or this is the old rule now or the sba said when you win your third contract you have to stop submitting offers and so it's kind of this confusion kind of rise between receiving wards and bidding and all this sort of stuff they said basically you got a two-year window to bid until you win your third contract and then you got to stop bidding and if you keep bidding or um, after either of those things happened then the sba could find you affiliated with your mentor which means that your their size would be added to yours or, or mm -hmm. and, and nobody wants that now the small business is right, you know, the big. google <laughs> now they're like oh sorry you're a four billion dollar company you're like i only did one million in revenues last year and so nobody wants that so it's it's not a it's not a hard limit but affiliation is a bad thing and so you can kind of treat it as a hard limit uh sba got a lot of complaints about that you know three and two rules especially because in my complaint this has not been resolved yet was remember it's limited it, it's about the joint venture entity it's about the joint venture a or the coffee you know cup joint venture there right and and so when you hit the two-year rule or the two-year uh, mark november 30th 2022 wherever or get your third contract under the old rule you can either just stop working together with your friend, uh, your mentor or your protege, or you just form a new joint venture. That's where joint venture B comes in. Right. And now that resets the clock to zero, right? And so now, because it's based on the entity. And so you and your teammate, your partner can, you know, keep doing joint venture B, C, D. And that's why you see these, J, you do actually see JVs one, two, three, four. And so I have always said, hey, the three and two rule is kind of a gotcha for people who don't know the three and two rule, because you could win the exact same work with the exact same partner, um, and if you did it using one joint venture, you'd be affiliated. And if you did it using two joint ventures, you wouldn't be. And it, I, I don't see the the value in that, but that's what SBA has always right. said. They recently changed the three and two year uh, rule to get rid of the three part. And so now it's the it's just the two rule. And so now <laughs> the, the rule is when the, and this is just, when I said recent, I mean like 
two weeks ago. Like, I was going to say, because I'm, like, I'm like, I'm <laughs> like, yeah. how are you sick? Because again, I wake up reading this stuff every yeah, day. Yeah, no, I, you do. I mean, seriously, I think this rule went final. I think it was the 16th. I think so, about, about almost two weeks ago, exactly. Okay. Two weeks ago, exactly. Uh, okay, so they put it, it slid in right before Thanksgiving. <laughs> right, yeah, right. Yeah, they're, yeah, you, they're doing you, that. So. Uh, right, you couldn't. Yeah, that's right. And that. it's buried, by the way, it's buried in this long rule with all this other stuff in there. So uh, it's, it's you know, somewhere the, the, the SBA likes to do these comprehensive rules and they, they label it like, hey, you mentor protege rule, and then somewhere buried in there is this other I stuff. almost feel like we should go live just because of this. <laughs> we probably should advise people on this, but the, the three part is is gone. And so now it's a two rule. And so what the rule now says, when a joint venture wins its first contract, you got two years to submit offers. You can submit as many as you want. You can win as many contracts as you want during that two, that two year period. Once the two years expires, stop submitting offers with that joint venture entity, which at least gives you certainty because you don't know when you're going to get an award. You don't know the day the, the award's coming. And so sometimes people were caught uh, unaware as all of a sudden they're about to submit a bid and they got that third award. And they're like, uh oh, we had a proposal due tomorrow and now we got to form a new joint venture, get it in Sam, it's impossible. Now you can at least put on your calendar, tickler, whatever you use, it, you know, note to self, form new joint venture in October of 2022 right. because our two year window is about to expire. Unfortunately, it is still a gotcha for people who don't know the rule because if you, if you again, bid on that work past the two year Mark, it can be found affiliated, winning the same contracts with the same partner, uh, but with one joint venture versus two, et cetera, can still get you in trouble. So I don't like that. I don't like, you know, ticky tack gotchas, but right. it is what it is. It's an improvement over the three and two rule because like I said, now you now you if you know the rule, you can just calendar the date. And if you want to keep working with your partner, you form a joint a new joint venture and get it in Sam. And you've got to, you know, you know, when that, that expiration date is coming, you're not caught unawares and scrambling to form a new JV or transfer your, your proposal to a prime sub team when you have joint venture throughout it and it's due at five o'clock and it's 2 PM and you all of a sudden realize you need to, uh, need to wow. tra- change it to a, to a, uh, prime sub. Wow. 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 No, that's, that's, uh, no, I thank you for that. And, and, uh, what's interesting is that I had no idea that changed and I just, again, it, these are things that, you know, that exist out there that are happening and you're just like, there's so there much be a better I mean, way. <laughs> there has to be a better way. There there's be- so much. And, you know, we, we write on these things on our blog, a small gov con blog. Right. Um, you know, we're, but I mean, I started that blog about 12 years ago now, I think. And, um, you know, it was, uh, and I was thinking to myself, well, I have enough, uh, to, to, uh, talk about you know in other words where they'll be oh thanks they're pulling it pulling it up there and this is the blog and so you can see that the blog here um and we write uh most weekdays we're posting new things this sba rule that i mentioned we probably wrote six seven eight posts about different things that came up in that that rule i don't expect that folks uh read this day to day but that we do try to highlight some of these things like i said when i founded this blog years ago now my my main concern was, will there be enough to write about? Will, will there be enough things going on? And, uh, needless to say, the actual problem is there's too much to write about. We, <laughs> you know, despite everything that's going on, we don't right. cover we don't cover everything that's happening in government conduct. But yeah, that's our our blog. There, as you just showed, thanks for doing that. And we we tr- we highlight you know what what's going on in government contracts with a with an emphasis really on things we think will be of note to small businesses, which is right. why it's called. Small enough No, no, and I love your blog. And um, I um, I first discovered it in LinkedIn, and I think it was great. A lot of people share the content. Um, it's, it's you know well written, high quality content. So I you know I do use it as a reference. In fact, I um, uh, one of the areas that someone was uh, we were t- I was discussing with a contractor recently was the rule of two. Yeah. Um, and I think I referenced some articles from your your blog post on the rule of two. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, we've written we've written plenty about that, about the small business rule too, and then of course the infamous VA rule of two with Kingdomware and, and right. how, how that's been interpreted. Yeah. And so, how do you how do you, how would you interpret the rule of two for those of us who are unfamiliar with the rule of two? Yeah. So they're 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 really, they're really well, there are multiple <laughs> rules of two out there, right. but the main ones are the the small business rule of two, and then I'll talk about the VA one. So the small <laughs> business rule of two says that in general, and I'm oversimplifying here because it gets in, there's a slightly different formula for simplified acquisitions versus non-simplified, but it's it's a FAR provision. And it basically says that if a contracting officer has a reasonable expectation of receiving two or more uh, offers from small businesses at fair market prices, 
that the acquisition should be set aside for small businesses or some subcategory of small business like HubZone, A right. uh, et cetera. And so it is the way, it is the primary way that the FAR implements the general policy that the government is supposed to make good faith efforts to prioritize small business contracting. And that's the, is the primary way the government tries to achieve that was a 23% uh, goal of prime contract dollars for small business. There are exceptions to that. There are plenty of exceptions to everything. There are obviously there are times the government can do sole source contracts. GSA schedule is exempt from the rule of two, for instance, uh, all sorts of buys under different IDIQs and GWACs and whatnot. But, but, you know, and then of course DOD has their OTAs. Now you hear about the, you know, yeah. and they've had that for a while, but in right. other agencies, but now they're, it, pushing they're using it, it now. Someone, they're using someone, it someone, now. CSOs, <laughs> BAAs, they're using all that stuff now. Yeah, they were looking, someone was hunting through the statutes one day. It's like, hey, we've got this OTA thing. Right, That's right. Right. No, 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 so, they're finally pushing that. They're pushing but that rule of two for small businesses is still, uh, is still a, a powerful thing. And, and if the government, based on its market research, fails to set aside an acquisition that could be set aside, that could be a successful protest. You can file a bid protest with GAO or the court and say, hey, there are 25 small businesses that are capable, interested, would submit fair prices, and you're not, you're not setting it aside. So that's the rule of two that, that, that affects most folks. The one that's actually gotten the most ink over the years are really pixels th- these days, I guess, is the VA specific right. rule of two. And that is for SDVOSB, service disabled, veteran owned small business. And that's the rule that at VA only, and it's a statute. The ru- remember the, the rule of two that I just talked about is in the FAR, which is a regulation. It's not something Congress mandated. The, the FAR council essentially created that or the predecessor to the FAR council to implement the, just the broad policy favoring small business. By statute, though, Congress has insisted that the VA do a rule of two for SDVOSBs, service disabled veteran owned small businesses, specifically at the highest priority at VA over anybody. And so that's that's the rule that says if the VA has a reasonable expectation of getting two or more qualified, capable SDVSBs, they're going to bid at fair market prices, that the a VA is required to set aside for SDVSBs or do a sole source uh, for SDVSBs. And then if they don't meet that criteria, then they're supposed to run another rule to analysis for VOSBs. And, and VA is the only agency that has the authority to do set asides and sole sources for VOSBs. And that, that rule got a lot of attention. I know you have, and many of your listeners have heard of this Kingdomware mm-hmm. Supreme Court decision. And that was a case that came out it's almost five years now. It was about four and a half years ago where the VA had, a, had, a, had been um, in the eyes of many in the veterans community violating the rule of two by saying that any buy off the GSA schedule didn't, didn't count. And that is actually true on the under the small business side. Remember, the, the GSA schedule is exempt from the small business rule two in the FAR. But the Supreme Court said that's not how it works for the statutory VA rule of two. That you can't just say, oh, any GSA schedule by is exempt. And the rule of two is mu- is very powerful at the VA. It's a matter of statute. It's what Congress has insisted on. And so the VA's uh, options for circumventing it are are very narrow. And so that was the the rule of kingdom where which. That was a unanimous Supreme Court decision in favor of the, uh, the veteran-owned small business that had filed that complaint, saying you shouldn't be buying on the schedule without first running that rule of two analysis. And the the Supreme Court agreed on that. And I, I actually was in the courtroom while they were arguing that case. It was really? a, lot, a lot of fun. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it, no I, way. I had to be there. I was blogging on it so much. I was I didn't represent Kingdom where they had a great great counsel. Was doing it pro bono, by the way. But I did consult with them a little bit. Um, and, and filed a brief in the case supporting what uh, what Kingdomware had argued, and then thought after all that, I better be there to to Get watch uh, watch my buddy argue the case, and did did, did a great job. And uh, and they you won eight to zero. Yeah, eight to zero. Yeah, How I was there. Get, like, so anyone could go. Uh, yeah, the, the way the Supreme Court works, I, I got special treatment because I'm a member of the Supreme Court bars. <laughs> so oh, I have, so yeah, I know I got, I, I got to sit in like, the fifth row or whatever, but yeah, anyone can go to Supreme Court argument. It's kind of first come first serve in the general public. I got to go in the special line for lawyers, you know, so I got a better seat, but, but if you line up early enough in the day, um, you could get in and, and, you know, a case like this, there were absolutely advocates there who wanted to get in, but it wasn't one of those cases that the whole country's watching because oh, it affected no, only, only right. certain certain folks. So, so if you wanted to go to that case and we're willing to wait a few hours, you, 
you could go and, and okay. it was it was really fascinating to to watch. I, I I watched the oral argument, then like dash back to my hotel room and immediately did a webinar <laughs> about what I had just had just seen. So it wow. was it was it was a fun, fun, memorable experience. Wow. Wow. No, I like that. I like that. Um, what other uh, what other new things are happening out there um, that we should know about? Yeah, there's, there's so recent much changes. I mean, there's so many recent changes. Yeah, I know it's, it's, it's all fascinating. It, it um, really is. Yep. What about what about the the average size um, going from three years to five years? Right, uh, right. There's so much going on. Size I mean, standards tables have been going up. It seems like every year or two. That's right. And so there's a lot of the SBA is, you know, the SBA is the agency that's in charge of deciding if a company is small or not. And remember, in government contracting, you're smaller, what the SBA calls other than small, which everybody else calls large. But <laughs> it, enca- it encapsulates businesses that, that, that for, and in fairness, don't view themselves as large. They're, they're right. just not small anymore. And they're, they're midsize, or uh, I guess they would probably call themselves mid-tier uh, but they are other than small. And so the, you know, the SBA sets these size standards industry by industry basis based on the NAICS codes, North American Industry Classification System Code. And the SBA has authority to set those size standards. So one thing you mentioned, the SBA does do a rolling review of its size standards to decide if they should be increased, decreased actually, or stay the same. Uh, they have been doing recently publishing proposals to increase a number of size standards right. um, in in services and construction. They just published right. one last last week, I think, in, in educational industry thing like, things like that. Um, they did not propose to decrease any size standards. They are actually allowed to do that, and That's... and based on their formulas, they said actually that they, they if they just applied whatever and they start getting into math. I mean, remember, I'm not a math guy. Okay. They start getting into math and say, you know, uh, you know statistics, and then you know, I, I I quit that as soon as I possibly could. Um, but you know, if we just applied the formulas we use without any adjustments, we would actually decrease the number of size standards, mm. uh, is what the SBA said. But they said, um, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Small businesses are having a, ba- a rough time of it. We think it would be detrimental to small businesses if, you know, given current conditions, we started kicking people out, essentially right, saying, hey, right. guess what? You're not small anymore. We just decreased your size standard. So what they've done in the in the proposal is say either the size standards are staying the same or they're going up. Okay. And that's and that's probably where, where the final rule will be. I, I you know at some point on the on our blog, I'm going to highlight. Hey, everybody, just just so you know, there's no guarantee that size standards always go up. They right. they could actually right. go down. Uh, last time SBA did the review, it was uh, like this. It was like you know, middle of the economic crisis that you, we remember from several years ago. And so they had the same analysis. Like, oh, we're in the middle of a economic crisis. We better not. Um, decrease size standards, but maybe next time things are going gangbusters and there's no real reason why they wouldn't. De- so we'll, we'll see. Um, the, the, this three versus the five is really interesting because you say, okay, well, the size standards are calculated primarily in, in two ways. One is based on your employee count. And usually that's if you're providing manufactured products, the SBA looks at your average annual employee count over the course of a year, if you're a manufacturer or a supplier or distributor. Uh, the second, for for services businesses and construction primarily, any type of service industry, um, you know, engineering, architecture, what have you, as well as general construction, especially trade, is based on your what's called your average annual receipts. Mm-hmm. And so your average annual receipts, and you say, okay, well, what's a receipt first? It, you know, it <laughs> it simplifies down as is roughly your your revenues. It's oversimplified again, and just in the interest of keeping your your listeners awake here. Um, but you can look that definition up because it's not it's not spot on to to your your revenues. Uh, but then the question is, averaged over what? You know, averaged over what period? And so the SBA for a long time, for many many years, has said it was your last three completed fiscal years. And so you, you know your ongoing year doesn't count. But once you complete your fiscal year, which for most businesses is concurrent with the calendar year, right. not all. The government, of course, is not concurrent with the calendar year. But most right. businesses run their fiscal year calendar year. And so once that fiscal year concludes, then we average those last three together and that produces an average. So if you know it was 10, 20, and 30, then your average is 20. That's your size for that for that next year. Your average of your last three. A couple years ago now, Congress uh, thought, hey, it would be a good idea if people could stay small longer. So instead of three years, let, let's use five years. And they called it the Small Business Runway Extension Act. In other words, your runway to be a small business is longer. And it, and it kind of, it was very well intentioned. Congress's uh, idea was, look, you know, instead of 
10, 20, 30, what, you know, and then the next year is 40 and the 10 goes away. We can't use that in the average anymore. It'd be really nice if you could still use that 10. And maybe the year before it's five. It'd be really nice right. if you could, in other words, right. bring back those lower numbers from years ago. The problem, of course, is that that presupposes that businesses always grow. Right. Exactly. Right? That, that's that's <laughs> forget the problem. We're on a roller coaster. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, we're actually it, on a roller it's coaster. It's very well intentioned, but it's sort of a naive view of business in that businesses are always growing. Well, and it, it comes from that, Congress. That's why. Right. And it's Congress. <laughs> and, and I worked in Congress. Now I get how it is. It's and like it came from Congress. They don't businesses. always, you know, and so it was very well intentioned, but it said, SBA, you must use a five year period. And for, for some folks in the growing small business model, that was great. They're like, great, we can bring in that year we were 5 million from five years ago and we're still small because that counts equally to our current year of 50 million. Awesome. Right. But for business that's had those ups and downs or even been just been shrinking and that can happen for many reasons. But you think about the current environment right. and how many businesses, especially with exposure to you know service industries, restaurant, whatever it is, catering, you know, uh, hospitality, all, all sorts of travel and leisure businesses, they're, they're having a big big, big trouble with the, the pandemic. And a lot of government contractors are, you know, also in the commercial marketplace. And so you get a lot of folks whose revenues right now, I think are, are down, down severely. And yet they're still now required to bring in revenues from, from five over, years ago, right. <laughs> from five from years the profitable ago, years. Right. from the profitable years. And so Congress did tweak the statute ultimately and said there could be essentially a grace period that goes now till 2022 where you can choose. And so now you can choose whether you use a three or a five, which is great for the next two years. After that grace period ends though, you have to use the five for better or for worse. And I worry that with 2020 being a down year for so mm -hmm. many folks, using the five is ultimately going to be a, you know, a, a negative for some people, but that's, that's where it is right now. But right now, if you get, if you get your size challenged, uh, and you're in one of those uh, receipts-based NAICS codes, you can choose. You say, I want to be evaluated on a three-year standard or I want to be evaluated on a five-year standard. Maybe by the time 2022 is approaching, Congress will say that, because I, what I had basically proposed was, why don't you just make that permanent? Why don't you just let people always choose? Then they can right. use the one that's better for them. Then, they, you know, then, then the shrinking business can can pick the the three year standard, and the growing business can pick the five standard, and sure. it's a win win. You know, so what's what, what, what's their objection to that? I don't know. I, I I'm not. I'm not sure. You know, this is this is now. This is not SBA now. If we can, in fact, right, SBA. Course, right. uh, SBA will usually explain what they're doing. Though, and they're actually pretty good at it. When they when they propose a rule, they they usually give some pretty detailed commentary, better than a lot of agencies do, as to what they're doing. So I do commend SBA for. And what was interesting is about six eight months before Congress did the Runway Extension Act, passed it. SBA had said in a commentary. Yeah, someone had proposed we do a five years, and that's crazy. We're not, we're never doing that. And then Congress in insisted that they do it. Um, but, but Congress, I, I have not seen Congress give its rationale as to why it would end versus making kind of the permanent choice that you could choose which, which analysis was better for you. And so maybe, maybe small business advocates will be able to get Congress to. Uh, make that a, a permanent change instead of a grace period. Because I think, especially, like I said, with the current environment now, I am concerned that um, forcing uh, small businesses to use those older years, even though they've had maybe a down 2020, maybe they're going to have a down start to 2021 until right. we really Thanks. get this under right. control, right. that being forced to bring in 2018 and 19 17 longer is not going to be a benefit. But yeah, I, I, I unfortunately have not seen, but Congress, of course, is Congress. They, they, they don't always speak with one voice. So you know, we'll, we'll see what they, uh, we'll see what they come up with. And then we, and like I said, there's a grace period now. So, so whichever, whether you're growing or shrinking or going up and down right now, you've got your, your option. And then we'll have to see where that's, this goes in a couple of years. What, um, it's interesting when you, when you talk about Congress, um, I have to find them. What, what other things, changes that are happening that you see can impact small businesses? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on there. And so the SBA has uh, recently ma made some changes to its small business regulations in addition to the three and two rule uh, going by the by. SBA has made some clarifications to its joint venture rules, which are 
were overall helpful. It's consolidated the 8A mentor protege program. I saw that with the yeah with the all small program. So now there's just one mentor protege program. When did that happen? When did that happen? Uh, uh, that happened. That was uh, took effect two weeks ago now. So there is no 8A. Yeah. Jeez, everything on Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> everything, on, everything on everything on Thanksgiving. I'm like, I feel like I'm behind. I'm like, why am I behind? I don't I know this stuff. <laughs> no, you're 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 good. I mean, it's just been a, a massive dump of just new stuff going on. Okay. Okay. Uh, lately, um, folks are getting worried, and this is not my area to, to, to advise them specifically how to do it with this CMMC. You've heard the cybersecurity uh, certifications, which are getting folks all tied in knots. I they're still <laughs> having issues with that, though. From what I've read and what I've seen, yeah. they still haven't decided on, you know, who's going to be in charge. You know, who's who's going to be the third party uh, qualifiers or certifiers. All that stuff yeah. is still like kind of up in the works. Yep, you're exactly right. They're still kind of, you know, they're getting a lot of pushback as you'd expect from industry and, um, you know, the, the, both the big the power players and small businesses. Weren't, weren't there a couple of scandals already with that? Like some people who were supposed to be like third party certifiers were trying to like uh, lobby to be the, the, the I haven't vendors. heard something about that. I don't know enough to, to weigh That's in okay. on it, but I've, I know I've heard some folks when a water, I guess, virtual water cooler talk these days about right folks having conflicts of interest or something right. like that. I haven't, uh, haven't pulled the thread on, but I've, I've certainly seen some of that going on out there. What's interesting right now, there's, there's a lot of stuff that's potentially pending. Uh, the, uh, the national defense authorization act and, and every year the NDAA is, you know, it's the, it's the bill that authorizes funding for the DOD. It's passed by a large bipartisan majority, uh, every year. And oftentimes, I think because it's passed by a large bipartisan majority every year, uh, Congress tends to cram a lot of contracting stuff into that bill, even if it's not DOD specific. One thing that's in the bill that we remember that in the, in the bill, typically the NDA starts one version in the House, one version in the Senate, then they get together in a conference committee and hash out their differences. So the House version of this year's bill has a requirement that the uh, certification or what they call verification at VA of SDVSBs go government wide. And so right now, if you're a, if you're an SDVSB and you're not bidding on VA work, you don't have to be verified. It's still self-certification mm. uh, under the SBA's program. And so what the uh, NDAA house version would do is say, nope, you're going to have to get yourself verified, even a bid on a DOD SDVSB set aside contract. And they would take that CVE, you know, the, the, the VA's Center for Verification and Evaluation, actually take it and move it under the SBA's uh, jurisdiction. Say SBA is running the CVE now, and it's going to verify SDVSBs for uh, every a a agency's acquisitions. Uh, the, the Senate bill does not include that provision. And so the, the House and Senate right now, as I understand it, are meeting in conference to hash out their differences. So I'm curious to see what happens. I've, I've predicted for a number of years that you're going to see a government-wide SDVSB certification requirement or verification, whatever you want to call it, uh, requirement. It's the only remaining socioeconomic set-aside program where you can self-certify, you know, following the woman-owned small business right. adopting a certification earlier this year. So, and, and these programs are co compl complicated enough, I think, and confusing enough that even folks who aren't trying to commit fraud often get their self certifications wrong. They, 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 the right, the rules know. for ownership and control are just, I mean, this is how I have a, a day job, right? It's, it's, it's yeah, explaining no. this stuff. And so, folk, you know, people are concerned about fraud and they should be. There, there are fraud in the, you know, there is fraud in these programs. But when I see folks who get um, in trouble for uh, incorrect SDVSB certification or previously woman owned, it's usually because they just messed up and they just didn't right, understand right. No, the no, rules sure. and they, they heard it, was, it had to be veteran known, but they didn't really understand the, the, what that meant and what the control requirements were. So, so I think on balance, that would be a positive. People are going to push back and say, no, I don't want to have to get a certification, but, but I think it's better to get certified on the front end than to, self-certify get protested on the back end and then lose your contract because if you get protested and lose then your contract goes away and so there's much more hanging in the balance when you self-certify and get protested than there isn't just applying for a certification in a vacuum speaking of protests you mentioned earlier on the rule of two if if the market research indicates there's uh, small businesses out there that can do this you could essentially protest would that be yep. a pre-bid protest at what you know when do you protest 
Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And so there, you you protest probably to the GAO. That's where most okay. bid protests go. You could protest to the agency itself, um, and that's some folks choose to do that. Try to get a review above the contract and officer's level. You could pro- protest to the Court of Federal Claims, which hears you know probably only you know five percent of the amount of protests as as GAO for cost and efficiency reasons, but. Um, most of those protests are going to go to GAO. Where, wherever you go, it would be what you say is a pre-bid, pre-proposal protest. So they're really, time-wise, there are two species of protest. There's your, you know, what some folks call pre-award, but you used a better term, which is pre-bid protest, which means right. you have to file it before the due date for proposals or bids. Right. And that then any challenge typically to the ground rules of a competition have to be filed uh, by that date. Otherwise, kind of speak now or forever hold your peace. Because the idea being, look, if you don't like the way the rules are written for this competition, you don't get to just sit back and see how it plays out and then challenge right. the whole thing after right. the fact. You know, like right. yeah, that that is like, oh no, I didn't get the contract. Well, right. the, yeah, it should have been set aside. Darn it, you know. <laughs> and so, and uh, so there are minor exceptions to that for what's called latent defects, but those are those are unusual. And the set aside uh, status is not a latent defect. And so if you see it, uh, it's right there on the front of the solicitation, it says unrestricted. Yeah, right. And so if you you see it says unrestricted and you say well wait a second you know they did an rfi and i submitted one i know my buddy over there did and i'm pretty sure my evil enemy over there who's always beating me at solicitations you know they submitted one so you could you could file a protest saying look you know there are you had at least two qualified capable small businesses that should have been assessed aside. rule of two required it you had the information any reasonable market research would have produced a decision there or enough information to be confident that you're going to get uh, multiple bids from qualified, capable small businesses at fair prices, and sometimes those protests will get sustained. But you're absolutely right; you got you got to file that protest if you're going to file it at all uh, before the due date for proposals. And what I see is, of course, a lot of folks when it comes to these pre-bid uh, protests are like, "Oh heck no, I'm not I'm not protesting you know my potential customer before I even submit my proposal." Right, That's not right. you know it's it's a relationship thing. Right. And so one thing that we have often done with our clients is say, "Look, you know." Yeah, you can file the formal protest, but we could also, you know, informally go to the contracting officer and, and complain about whatever it is, whether it's a set aside designation or any other stats and say, look, we really, really don't want to protest. We, 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 we hate protests. Protests are terrible. Um, but look, you know, this is a, this is a flaw in the solicitation. It's ambiguous. It's vague. It's it's incorrectly set aside, whatever. Please reconsider your decision. And unfortunately, if you, you know, if you can't see it within yourself to, to amend the solicitation by, you know, the day before the proposals are due or whatever, we're going to have to file protests. And I've actually found that works at a, you know, I, I, maybe 40, 50% of the cases. I mean, it works a fair bit, especially if you, if there's something that's a pretty clear flaw in the solicitation, sometimes people are, you know, I've had clients who didn't want to protest obvious ambiguities, like, you know, paragraph one says the period of performance of the base period is nine months. And paragraph two says it's one year. All right. Well, if you call that to the agency's attention, they're going to fix it. And right, people are right. scared. To, no, no, no. I can't. I can't. I can't bring that. There's no Q&A period. I'm like, hey, so what? Just send them an email. It's fine. Right. Say, say, you are you know, I don't know whether to bid. And they're like, no, no, I'll just guess. I'm just going to guess it's nine months. And you're like, oh, oops, underpriced it. You know, it's like, so it's, yeah. If, if you bring those sorts of obvious defects to the contract officer's attention and, and you do it politely and professionally and you don't have to, it doesn't have to be as part of a formal Q and A. There's no rule that says you can't, I mean, you can't contract the contract officer and offer bribes and stuff, but you can certainly no. contract them and say, Hey, guess what? Um, I know there's no Q and A, but paragraph one is inconsistent with paragraph two. Could you please consider an amendment? And they're almost certainly going to do it. You know, that's, that's my experience. Have you seen any changes uh, recently because of what happened with our supply chain and COVID um, with them now Going back to the Buy American Act, I saw something like that. I saw some language on your one of your GovCom posts about it. Yeah, but I've there's... also seen I've seen um, you know contracts, and I've seen uh, you know Congress put out uh, bids, invitation for PPE suppliers, and things like that. And so, as this warning, have you seen any any language coming down that's changed that? And I'll and I'll tell you why. Um, about a year ago, um, I had on my show uh, a company that made. Um, cutlery, flatware, silverware, right? Yep. Forks, knives, things like that. They were the last remaining USA made cutlery company in the country. Yep. Wow. Okay. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Only one in the whole country. Wow. The uh, other yeah. companies were still advertising as USA made, even though they were sourcing from China. Wow. And they were well, on GSA not, schedule. Yeah. 
<laughs> right? And and I could send you this, by the way, Stephen, if you want to take this on as a yeah. personal challenge, okay? Uh, because this is a great company out of New York. And what she said was when they went to GSA, GSA made the statement that we do not, um, how do they say? We don't, we don't, they said they are basically a platform that uh, takes the information and puts it out to um, the, you know, the agencies to use yeah. their platform. They don't actually qualify the, the validity of the information. Okay. And so it's up to yeah. you to say, okay, if you find someone that is uh, proposing something that's not true or making claims that are untrue, it's up to you to, to respond, to let us know, so then we can do something about it. And I that was see. their stance. <laughs> huh, that's, that's kind of crazy. It's like they had taken no responsibility. Took no responsibility. <laughs> huh, wow. And this is on the GSA platform. That's hard to believe that they wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I will. I'll send you the links and the articles. I'll send you man, everything that I have. Kind of, I mean, yeah. There's. I mean, uh, self policing is part of it, but you got some obligation, I think. <laughs> I would think I, so. As GSA, uh, right? The GSA. Right. Platform. I mean, say no, not our, not our problem. I think it is, <laughs> and <laughs> that's that's amazing. No, I, I think yeah. There's been a renewed emphasis on Buy American. I think okay, part okay. of it's pa pandemic. Um, keep in mind that they're really kind of two two major. Um, statutes that apply here and, and we're not going to get into a, right. a you know, but there's a there's a trade agreements act which is one mm -hmm. kind of preference statute which sort of overrides these some of the buy american preferences and domestic preferences and then there's the buy american act which really provides uh preferences for domestic products and when i say preferences i really mean preferences you know there's a buy american act at its heart is a preference statute not a mandate uh, in other words the buy american act has an exception that says essentially the government can buy foreign made products uh, if the price premium to buy domestic is so high that it would be unreasonable to so it, it creates a balancing test in most cases there are there are cases where domestic products are mandated such as uh, the berry amendment which applies right. to dod uh, products and then you've got uh, sources that are prohibited for example under the trade agreements act when that applies such as china being the, you know the key example of a you know a source that is not trade agreements act compliant but when under the buy american act what you have is and when that applies and applies to most small business set asides and other types some other types of contracts too is a preference for domestic products and the you know depending on who the agency is dod versus civilian you could pay a certain premium and uh, buy a, a foreign, uh, you know, before a foreign product would become essentially um, compatible with that with that statute. And so, recently, there's an executive order um, that that kind of strengthens some p pieces of the Buy American Act, saying, uh, first of all, kind of the test as to what is a foreign product. There's this this component test that you know, because you say, well, some you know, how do we decide if the product is a sneaker and the you know the the leather was made in one in one country and the laces are made in another and the you know the rubber insoles made you know how do we decide if that's a domestic product or not and so there's this test that talks about you know our 50 percent essentially are of the components manufactured in the united states and then the final assembly is that done in the united states and so this executive order would um kind of take the test and, and make it a, a stricter test but requiring more components more a greater percentage of the components to be manufactured domestically for the item to qualify as a domestic product and then uh the uh the executive order um and i haven't checked to see whether this has been implemented in the far yet or defars or not the executive order was supposed to be effective this year um it would also require uh, that the price premium essentially be adjusted upwards. In other words, instead of saying, hey, you can buy a domestic uh, product or excuse me, a foreign product, if you're if the domestic product is 6% more expensive, it would say 20% more expensive, you know, thing, things like that. So essentially it keeps the price premium in place, but requires, um, you know, it would allow for a greater price premium to be paid for domestic products. And then that all overlaps with the kind of ongoing, as you've seen, the you know, section 889, you know, telecommunications ban and the idea of, hey, you know, in addition to kind of trying to draw in and source more domestically as a general matter, when it comes to certain and at this point telecommunications products, we don't want our contractors using products that might be uh, essentially compromised by our adversaries, in this case, China, you know, and so 
you know, we don't, if you have these, these telecommunications products, we want, we want those out. We don't know if these Chinese companies are being um, controlled by the Chinese military or the government or whatever, and using these products in a way that is going to be detrimental to national security. And so that kind of, it's not a, it's not a Buy American Act, but kind of overlays and is part and parcel of, kind of, I think, the administration's mindset overall by, because of COVID, because of national security of trying to domesticize really as much of the contracting as possible while keeping in mind that some products either cannot be bought domestically because they're just not produced. Right. And there's right. a list, the right. SBA has a list of these. They're just, they're just not produced domestically. And you mentioned you knew they're the last manufacturer <laughs> domestically of a product or that in some cases, if we're not talking about a national security problem, that we're just, you know, we've got a balancing act still where the right. taxpayer should only be required to pay so much more of a premium, you know, especially if you're a sole source, you're the only domestic supplier, you can jack that price you know, as high as you can go because you're the only <laughs> domestic company. Well, at some point, that's the benefit to the taxpayer is outweighed by the extra price that that we're paying. And so that there's always that tension between those you know, we want to support domestic industry versus, yeah, but we also as government ha- are stewards of the public fisc and how much right. more are we willing to pay for that? I, I can tell you, um, Stephen, I'm, you know, all this stuff is very fascinating to me. I don't know if you can tell. Oh, I, I mean, yeah, you and me both. I'm a, you know, as you can tell, I'm a, I'm a nerd about procurement. So I can just yeah. talk about this stuff. I love, I love day, this stuff. You know? I'm, I'm, I, I'm very excited. I mean, and I am a morning guy, so I'm wide awake. Oh, good for you. I'm, I'm <laughs> wide awake only because of my huge mug of coffee. So yeah, you know, I'm wide awake. So this is great to me. Uh, a couple more things and I'll let you run. Um, you mentioned something when you were just talking and it brought me up the 809 panel. Did they go away? Yeah, as far as I know, they're no longer constituted. As far as I know, the Section 809 panel, for those of your uh, listeners who aren't aware of that, was a Blue Ribbon Commission convened by Congress uh, a few years back as one of those NDAAs as part of the Mm -hmm. Section 809 panel group because it's from Section 809 of whichever year of NDAA it was, maybe 2016, 2015, something like that. But they were tasked with uh, making kind of broad-based recommendations for trying to improve uh, DOD acquisition specifically. It was directed at DOD, this being the NDAA, although oftentimes if something happens on the DOD side, then it's not long before it, it gets copied on the, the non-DOD side or civilian side, if I can, you know, I have people say, well, that's not exactly the right terminology, but the non-DOD side uh, as well. So the, this Blue Ribbon Commission came out with three reports, which I, you know, about is really directed at trying to like streamline and improve the efficiency of DOD acquisitions, a, a three reports, which I think totaled about 2000 pages of material, which I was like, Oh, it's a streamlining panel with a report. That's like this thick, you know, right. but, but they, they had some good recommendations, some bad, some ugly, in my opinion. Um, some right. of them were implemented others, others not. As far as I know, that panel is no longer out there okay. uh, as an active entity. I, I went to their website the other day and it still exists. The website is still out there. You can still read the reports, um, the recommendations that the panel made, uh, but I don't believe they're currently active making any new recommendations. Okay. 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 Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, the hub zone program, I know. Um, and again, I, I, you know, I, you know, I speak with people from the hub zone national council. I know there are a lot of issues with the program and, and um, sole sourcing. Some of the regs were difficult for contracts and officers to be able to use the hub zone program to sole source contracts, to work contracts. Have we worked through some of those issues? I think so. Yeah. And so that it's, yeah, great, great organization, by the way, the hub zone national council, good leadership there. Uh, and I know them and, and work with them and have been to their right. conferences a few times. So it's, it's a good organization, but yeah, I think the hub zone program um, it, it, and some of your listeners may know this and others may not is a, a, alone among the socioeconomic preference programs. The government in recent years has been unable to reach its goal for contracting with hub zone companies. And by unable, I mean, not even close. The goal is 3% of prime contract dollars to hub zones. And the actual achievement last year was about 2%. That's actually an improvement over previous years where it was down to 1%, not, not 1%, but like 1.8 or you know right. something like something like that. And so, you know, then that's been going on for years. This is inability to achieve. And they're, they're meeting the SWSB goal. They're meeting the uh, SDB, which includes 8A, small disadvantaged business goal. Uh, recently have met the woman-owned goal. That, that was, uh, they were unable to do that for a while, but recently hit that. That's a 5% goal. But HubZone have been unable to do it. And so I think part of the problem, uh, and SBA finally realized that, as, and I think, you know, you absolutely alluded to this, we're were kind of structural issues within the hub zone program itself and how the hub zone program was structured and how 
um, it was uh, applied in terms of, of contracts as well. And so, you know, one of the major structural issues has been the 35 percent requirement. And the 35% requirement uh, says that for most hub zone companies, this is not necessarily true for tribally owned businesses, which have a couple options to meet the rules. But um, the, the most hub zone companies have to have 35% of their employees living in a hub zone, uh, living in a, in a hub zone. It doesn't have to be the hub zone where their office is located. It could be any old hub zone. 35% of employees live in a hub zone. And so a couple problems with that uh, requirement. Number one, it was in being applied uh, not just when you applied to the program, but both on the bid date and award date of a contract. And so if you didn't hit the 35% number on either of those dates, you could have your, your contract taken away and your hub zone status stripped. And so, for example, let's say you've got 10 employees in your company, you've got four of them living in a hub zone, uh, one of them quits. Now right. you've got three employees out of nine and the next day you get awarded a contract. Oops, sorry, you don't have 35%. Right. And so one thing SBA did was remove that. And this is in a rule change that took effect, I think day after Christmas last year, mm -hmm. remove that requirement. They said, look, if you hit the 35% requirement on your date of certification and kind of on your annual, put in an annual renewal, then you know, you don't have to maintain the 35% on your bid date and award date. And that, that helped, I think, uh, a lot for folks who were just unable to, to meet that all the time, every single day. Um, they had to meet that. So that's one change. The SBA also made it easier for hub zone contractors to team with other companies. We mentioned the Mentor Protege. We started this conversation with Mentor Protege. It used to be that to form a joint venture in the hub zone program, the only way to do it was to join venture with another hub zone company. That's it. No, no mentors, no, no other small businesses, no eight A's. It had to be two hub zones. And how often did that happen? Not very often. Mm -hmm. And so it, it essentially took hub zone contracts out of the universe of uh, permissible joint venture targets. And so you, you know, mentors wouldn't, wouldn't mentor hub zone companies mm -hmm. if that's the only cert they had. Uh, hub zone companies weren't also able to team up with large businesses to pursue larger opportunities. And of course, this all then trickles down to the contract announcers who, when they do their market research, say, huh, we're not going to get any bids from hub zone companies. So I guess we're not going to do a hub zone set aside or sole source. Yeah. And so it all has this, this circular effect. So SBA did change that a couple years back and said, hey, hub zone companies, you too can have mentors. You too can, can form joint ventures with them to pursue hub zone contracts and make it easier for um, hub zones to get the, the, um, the same sort of benefits that the other preference programs have always uh, had. Um, there are still some, some problems with, with the hub zone program. The SBA did a number of other rule changes. And again, most of them taking effect either about 2016 or then again, last uh, December uh, to try to make the hub zone program friendlier and, and easier for folks to use. It is still a difficult program in some industries. You think about construction. I mean, they, they bring on a new workforce right. every time they get a new, right. a new job yeah. somewhere. And it depends on where that job's located. And then sure. those people come and go. And sometimes they're laborers who you know, live in a no. hotel or something. Yeah. Like, no, absolutely. I mean, it really, it's, it can be, it can be difficult in some industries and there's not, there's not really a great solution to that. Possibly. Um, don't forget they changed the hub zone maps as well. So yeah, you're in a hub zone map now. You're not in a hub zone map. Am I yeah. grandfathered in? Am I kicked out? Do I have to relocate my issue. office? That's exactly right. And so there, and, and SBA has frozen the hub zone maps now right. for a few years and provided a longer grace period for because because well, hub zone of course is based on the Census Bureau essentially designating your census tract right. as being underutilized, an underutilized business zone. And so one thing that happens, of course, is that as economies change, some some areas that were, you know, did, did meet the criteria to be labeled hub zone no longer do. And so if you have your office, your office has to be in a hub zone. In that hub zone, you have employees living there. And all of a sudden, SBA says, oh, guess what? It's not a, not a hub zone anymore. Then you've got a real problem on your hands. And so they've, they've added a now longer grace period. You still at some point um, have to um, move your office. You can't, can't stay there forever. Right. Um, but they, they have given you a long, cause I, we did have people essentially had the rug pulled out from under them and, oh, yeah. and some of it was notification problems. They were always giving some sort of notice, but it, but it became an issue. And so trying to give, provide a little more stability in that program, uh, provide more options for teaming with other companies, uh, make it easier to meet, meet that 35% requirement. Another thing SBA has done is said, and this one is actually subject to debate about whether SBA exceeded its authority in doing it, but that's another way has said, if an employee lived in a hub zone when you applied to the program and counted as a hub zone employee and lives there for six months after that, 
if they move somewhere else out of the hub zone, you can count them as a, a hub zone employee forever for as long as, as they work for you. And that, you know, that, that played into SBA's concern. And I think a justified concern that folks who live in uh, hub zones aren't always the nicest place to live. And so okay. when someone gets a job, a nice job with a contractor who's paying them a decent salary, right. And one of the first things they sometimes do is like, great, I'm leaving the hub zone, you know? And, <laughs> so, but now, like, uh, and then the employer is like, well, now you're not a hub zone employee. Now I got to right, fire you. And so right. it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. You don't want these people stuck where they don't want to live but by the same token. And you, you know, you don't want uh, people to get, uh, you know, fired or, or terminated because they moved it. And so SBA has essentially allowed them to be grandfathered in. That has been, uh, I guess, questioned by SBA's inspector general as to whether SBA had the statutory authority, in other words, whether Congress, right. uh, the authority that SBA gave or the Congress gave the SBA over the HUBZO program extended to kind of permanent grandfathering. That was uh, something that, S mm. that the IG called into question in the report that came out last month, I believe. Don't know where that's going to go, but on, on the books right now, that grandfathering is is totally permissible. It's, it's under the SBA's rules. I, you know, as I've been mentioning to my hub zone clients, just know that the question at least has been raised as to whether SBA w was allowed to do that, where, where, if anywhere, that question will go remains to be seen. But the bottom line is, yeah, SBA has, has really, I think, taken the bull by the horns. They've, they've understood that hub zone had structural uh, problems that prevented, you know, folk uh, uh, from getting that, that, um, certification to begin with, maintaining the certification, that in turn led government contracting officers not to issue uh, enough hub zone set-asides and sole sources. Um, hopefully that will change over time. I think the reputation became there just not a enough hub zones out there, and that's a harder thing to to uh, beat back than just with a structural rule change. But hopefully over time, and we did see that, like I said, the achievement for hub zone did tick up last year, and hopefully that'll be a continuing trend. And so let's talk about um... – the top 10 legal issues facing small businesses. Yeah. And obviously in our time, we're not going to cover, cover 10, you know, but I, let me, let me mention a couple that are, are really uh, important that I see come up all the time and that really folks can get in trouble. And that by the time they call me, it may be, may be too late to really get them out of that trouble. Cause I, I really like to be proactive when I'm talking with, with clients or anybody out there who, who, um, is uh, unfamiliar with some aspect of government contracting and you know it's a deep deep uh, area as we've mentioned so is, item number one and this is something that govern you know this blows government uh employees minds because they are trained uh completely differently um but m many folks in uh industry and government contractors believe that anybody who carries a government business card essentially can tell you uh, to do more work, to change your work, can essentially give you directives on a government contract that you're performing. And that is absolutely not true. That is absolutely not true. And so we see folks who say, well, my core contracting officer representative uh, suggested that since we got a freak snowstorm, I go shovel the walk, even though my job on the project was as a landscaper and I was supposed to be cutting the grass, but we had the equipment. So, uh, you know, she told me to go to go do it. So I did it. Now I want to get paid. Well, what's the problem with that type of scenario? Well, under the FAR, nobody uh, has authority to direct you to do any work or to modify your contract except the contracting officer. A warranted contracting officer acting within the scope of his or her authority. And contracting officers have warrants that actually, uh, it's not so they're arresting you, it's a warrant, it's, a, it's an entitlement to uh, essentially obligate the government to uh, a contractor to an obligation. And mm. so uh, oftentimes, whether it is by um, just a, a miscommunication or even just an unfortunate lack of training, perhaps by somebody like a core or project engineer or something right. like that, somebody else gives a directive to a contractor and the contractor or the contractor perceives a directive was given and the contractor goes out and does the work and then says, here's my invoice. What's the problem with that scenario? Well, the problem is the government doesn't have to pay it. They don't have to pay it. They can they can just say thanks for shoving the walk, but the the core wasn't authorized, so we're not we're not we're not going to pay. Wow. It. And and so you know sometimes you do get paid, and you do the reason you get paid though is not and this is unfortunate as well, is that folks get the idea if they get paid if you present your invoice and say thanks you know I, we did the walk here's the invoice, and then a few weeks later you get paid. Why is that? Is it because your core was authorized to do that? No. It's because the agency did something called ratification, which is where after the fact, the contracting officer says, 
Hmm. Well, Cor didn't have the authority to order that walk be shoveled, but we did need it shoveled. And, you know, I, I'm going to retroactively essentially authorize that to happen. That all happens behind the scenes. There's a whole process on it. But what the contractor sees, sometimes they get paid. And so they assume that, well, that must mean the Corps had authority. Anybody who carries a government business card right, right. has authority. And the problem is that the ratification is is totally optional. The, con- the, the, the contracting officer doesn't have to ratify. Often they do just because, well, the government got a benefit and it's the right thing to do. And right. they're actually good people at heart and all that sort of stuff. But they don't have to. And so I've seen cases where people actually did hundreds of thousands of dollars of work and it was unauthorized. And the agency says, yeah. We don't we're, we don't care to pay you for that. We're not going to. Thanks for the free work. See you later. And Ouch. so you got to be really, really careful, because what, what happens is in practice, a lot of contractors don't actually interact much with their contract officer. A lot of these contract officers oversee dozens of contracts. They're not have they're not in regular communication with that right. with the contractor. They may not even be at the same site. Right. And so they're regularly working with somebody else like a core like maybe a project engineer, who knows, some other government employee. And so they come to think of that person as their government contact. And in many cases, respects that person is, but not when it comes to anything involving new work or modification of the contract. In that case, you need a written directive from the contracting officer. Um, if, if somebody else directs you to do work, my advice is say, hey, I, you know, all, all due respect, you know, I went to this this training. You can make me the bad guy. And this crazy <laughs> lawyer came on and said, don't do work if if the contracting officer doesn't. So could you get the contracting officer to send me an email, you know, authorizing it, you know? Right. And, and, you know, government employees are trained on this stuff. They ought to know better. They really right. ought to know better right. than to authorize you to do work. But, but you got to protect yourself. And so the whole government business card, uh, scenario is one it's, it's, it makes sense you know that person works for the government it's someone that you work with day to day perhaps uh, but they don't actually have unless they're a warranted contract now so they do not have authority to order you to do work and while it may work out for you because of the ratification process you are performing at risk that means you are at risk of not getting paid a hundred percent of what you just did so don't do that i know and i because that's the situation where after the fact i'm trying to to come up with legal theories and ratification by silence and all this sort of stuff digging into mm-hmm. case law and now right. you're paying me thousands of dollars to try to you know parse through case law from the 70s or something to, to hopefully get you paid mm. when you you know is as uncomfortable as it may be if you're working with that person it's like yeah i could get your boss to send me an email it's better than not getting paid so okay. that's that's the advice there <clears throat> what else what else well and the other of? one i mentioned just in the interest of time that the only other one that i would mention right now um is with respect to uh sam profiles and so okay. this, is, this is a common one that comes up with with SAM profiles and the misconception with SAM profiles is they only need to be updated once per year. And that uh, anything that's said in the SAM profile is essentially valid for a year. Mm. In fact, the FAR says that anytime you bid on a government contract and incorporate by references is always the case pretty much these days, your reps and certs in SAM. Remember that long list of things that you went through, you know, and they're going to take your firstborn child if you don't get it right and all that sort of stuff. That long list of reps and certs, every time you submit a bid to the government or proposal to the government, you are certifying by submitting that bid that your reps and certs in SAM are current, accurate, and complete as of that date. Mm-hmm. And so what I get, for example, is folks who say, well, yeah, I, you know, I was a small business last August when I renewed my SAM profile. Then in January, I grew to be large, but I can keep certifying as small up until August because my, you know, my SAM profile doesn't need to be renewed uh, right, until August. To August. It's like, no, 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 no. If, when you submit a bid, every representation in SAM needs to be current, accurate, and complete as of the date of the bid. And so the one year is the minimum that, or excuse me, that is the minimum uh, requirement for you. You know, they, if, if nothing has changed, literally nothing has changed, then you still have to update it once a year. But if anything changes in those reps and certs, every time you submit a bid, it needs to be current, accurate, complete as of that day. You need to update your SAM. And so the, the notion that SAM profiles only need to be updated once a year is mistaken. That is the, the minimum requirement. But for mo- many folks, any of those certifications change. You've got to update it before you submit that bid. Otherwise, you're you're making a false certification to the government. And so you don't, you don't want to do that. So I, I get that. I, you know, I was kind of surprised when I first started getting it, but I was like that question, but, but I, you know, there's a lot of, of, 
training out there on Sam and about one year, one year, one year, one year, one year. And so when it, people combine that with the reps and certs, I sort of see logically where they're coming from there. It's just unfortunately not true. And I've had to explain that to a number of clients who, for example, had continued calling themselves small because their SAM profile hadn't been renewed, even though they had grown large and, right. and like, uh Oh, you're, you need to withdraw that proposal. You're not small anymore. You can't bid on small business set aside. You know, those, those sorts of things. And people don't want to hear that from me. They're right. like, Oh, you know, like, well, you want to, you want to withdraw your proposal or get charged with fraud. I mean, come on, you know? Uh, so, yeah. and again, it's a misconception. No one's trying to commit fraud by doing that, but you can get um, some, nasty responses from the government if your reps and certs are untrue so another another one no i guess i'll mention one more for you just because we said top 10 i'll do three all right, all right here we go the last one for you and this blows people's minds too um as far as the government is concerned 1099s 1099 uh -oh. independent contractors uh -oh. what are they they are subcontractors they are subcontractors they are not employees and so and by the way if you call them employees then you better be paying all your unemployment taxes and all that sort of stuff. Otherwise you're committing tax fraud. So if you're actually treating them like employees then you ought to bring them on as W2s. But what I, what I get a lot of times is folks treat their independent contractors differently than their, their company subcontractors. In other words, they say, well, they're an independent contractor. I'm just giving them this tiny little independent contractor agreement. I'm not including any FAR provisions. Actually, you got to flow down the, the FAR mandatory flow downs uh, to any subcontractor, including a 1099. When it comes time to compute whether you're meeting your limitation on subcontracting, for example, if you are in a set aside where you're only allowed to subcontract so much of the work, um, a 1099 does not count as a prime contractor employee for purposes of calculating that analysis. They are a subcontractor. And so, you know, you can't have it both ways. In other words, right. you can't tell the IRS that they are a 1099 and then you're not paying the unemployment insurance and the, you know, all that sort of stuff. While at the same time telling Uncle Sam essentially that they're an employee when you, when you want that to be true. And so remember, now that doesn't mean you need to give your, your independent uh, contractors a something that looks exactly like your subcontracts to companies. You can call it an independent contractor right. agreement if you want, instead of you know laying out FAR clauses. You never have to do this, by the way. You can include a little corporation by reference that says this hereby incorporates all the FAR clauses. But you got to remember, for wh whatever purpose you're using it, that if you have 1099s and you're properly classifying that them that way, as opposed to classifying them as W-2s, they're subcontractors, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're not, they're subcontractors. And so, you know, and by, please don't ever use, this is just a pet peeve of mine, the term 1099 employees. It's like they're, oh. they're one or the other. They're not, they're either uh. a 1099 or they're an employee. They're not 1099 employees. So please, please don't do that. That's just going to create confusion um, among SBA or even IRS. Again, I'm not a tax lawyer, but the IRS has a whole uh, list that I would recommend that if you're not sure, if you're properly classifying your employees one way or the other, Google IRS, independent contractor versus employee, and you can see the list of factors that the IRS would apply. And the SBA essentially defers to the IRS in that in that regard. So so make sure you classify your people correctly, W-2 versus 1099. And remember that if you are properly classifying someone 1099, that they are a subcontractor. They are not an employee for government contracting purposes. Stephen, where can we find you? Tell people yeah. to find you, how to reach you. Um, what reasons should they be reaching out to you for what type of issues, topics that you carry? Uh, yeah, I'm going to well, show on the website. I'm going to share with everyone on the screen now, small GovCon. Why were you finish up today? Fantastic. Well, there's, there's our, our blog, as you see the, uh, the small GovCon blog. And that's, we update that, as you know, uh, many times you see another post. Ah, oh, there's one of my posts up that our, our Shane McCall is the editor of the blog. Just posted one of mine while we were talking. So that's that's <laughs> great. I will I will update that. But yeah, we're we're easy to reach. And so a small GovCon blog, as you see, you can click on the contact button bar, uh, button there, and that's the easy way to reach our firm. You see our contact information also on the the right side. That's our general contact information. That's the main telephone number for all of us at the firm. Seven eight five. 208919. You can go to our separate website, coprince.com, just my last name, coprince.com. You see it there on the right hand side as well for more information about the firm. I'm on email all the time. You can find me scoprince at coprince.com. Very easy, just scoprince at coprince.com. Uh, please email me. Um, and I'm also on LinkedIn most business days. Love connecting with folks. Uh, so you can find me on LinkedIn, follow our firm on LinkedIn, because we're not only updating with our content from the blog, but with other things we see out in, in government contracting on our LinkedIn profile. 
uh, as well. And there you see our, our uh, homepage as is coference.com. And, the, and then you see you're asking about what sort of issues could folks contact us about? There you, there you go. There's a list of those types <laughs> of, of things that we, uh, that we address. You see if some of our, our teammates, uh, my teammates, they're all, all better looking than I am by, by a large amount over on the right there or on the left, excuse me, and on the right, you see our list of services. So uh, socioeconomic issues, FAR compliance, DFARS, mentor protege, team agreements, subcontracts. Yes, we do do the protests and the claims and those sorts of, of uh, disputes as well. Although we've, we've often found that, as I mentioned, we're able to resolve that, that with you know, informal communication with a contract officer, if it's a pre-award dispute, uh, even claims against a, an agency you can sometimes resolve with a, what's called an alternative dispute resolution, where you get some folks in a, in a room or on the phone or in a Zoom like, and now and, and hash it out as opposed to spending two years and you know, hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, uh, at least uh, litigating something. Not, not always possible. You can't always reach an amicable dispute but or a dispute resolution, but that's, that's always our, our goal when those things pop up. Steven, listen, thank you so much. Stay on. I'm going to just close out the YouTube, leave people with some parting words, and then you can I, you and I could chat for a few minutes just afterwards. Okay. That sounds good, Eric. I, uh, I, I, thanks for having me on. And I, you know, I'm, I'm impressed you keep talking and you've got another one. I understand this afternoon. So your, your voice is going to be a little hoarse, I suppose, but you, <laughs> mu- you must be used to it, my friend. So yeah, appreciate it. it's I been am. a lot of fun and uh, thanks for having me. All right. Thank you so much, Steven.